Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Living with the Pandemic, Safety Guidance for the Arts. Uh, my name is Julie Baker, Executive Director of Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates, and we'll just wait a couple of minutes here as we let everyone into the room, uh, as we know, the Zoom room, the virtual space that we all seem to be living in longer and longer. Um, so we will just give it a little bit as um, more people enter. So welcome, um, get comfortable, and I'm very excited for this uh, panel that we have today. And uh, so we'll just give it a couple more minutes. Thanks. Okay, well, it's a little bit slower than usual. Uh, maybe it's uh, getting towards the holidays because we had about 150 people sign up. So we usually get, uh, I don't know, about 60%. We're not seeing that quite yet, but we're gonna, in the interest of time, at least get started with some introductions. So um, again, uh, my name is Julie Baker and I am the executive director here at Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates. And my pronouns are she, she her, hers. and Coming today from the land, um, the unceded land um, of the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon, which is in a town called Nevada City, California, uh, which where it is currently snowing um, for those. This is the fun part of living in California. Uh, where I live, it's snowing. And uh, we're really thrilled to be doing this series. This is a third one that we have put together um, on living with the pandemic, which uh, I think when we first started, we thought, well, that seems like the right title. And for sure, uh, three months later, it is absolutely the right title as we recognize that we are learning to live with it. Um, and specifically safety guidance for the arts. And we've had the pleasure of working in collaboration on this in this series with um, the Center for Emerging Pathogens at the Keck School of Medicine of USC, and specifically with Dr. Neha Nanda, who is the founding director of the Center for Emerging Pathogens. And um, Dr. Nanda, thank you so much for all the work that you do um, in, in, the, in your, your day job. And then also as you've done with us here to really provide so much um, information and guidance for folks here in our industry around um, how to reopen and stay open and do it in a way that um, we can keep people safe. Um, so uh, before we get into introducing everyone who is here on the panel, I wanted to give Dr. Nanda a chance to also introduce uh, herself as well as um, what you are seeing right now in terms of where we are in living with the pandemic. Thank you, Julie. Uh, it's been a great collaboration with Julie and her team and our team here at USC. Um, you know, initially it just started uh, the, the, uh, the concept started really in the neighborhood, on a, here in my neighborhood in Pasadena, where we need to help people. This is last January. People didn't know how to navigate um, and look where we are now. Uh, we, there is really, we're just talking this morning, uh, you know, at the clinical enterprise. We keep using the term uh, post-pandemic. Um, is it really the right term? Not really. Uh, we shouldn't be looking at things just with a lens that revolves around a continent, if you think about it. Uh, we are very much in the pandemic. Having said that, um, I think we have come, all of us have come to the realization that we will be living with the virus for a long time. And we have to uh, continue our operations to the best of our ability. We have the best tools available that we have ever had in the history of mankind when it comes to taking down bugs uh, or fighting pandemics. Um, so with that, where are we today? Um, I, I, can, I can just keep talking about Omicron, but what before I get into that, um, 
and I'll not belabor it. I'll not bore you with the clinical and the scientific uh, uh, jargon. What I will say is that, you know, this Omicron variant, it's, um, uh, it's, um, it's, it's a little bit of a knock on our door uh, to tell us this is what life is gonna be, okay? Across the world, we have seen countries like Portugal where the vaccination rate was through the roof. Despite that, they saw upheaval. Look at states in our country. New York, pretty high, 70, 71% vaccination. And they are experiencing trouble within the health system. So my point being, these upheavals will continue to happen. We have to hardwire and embrace all the knowledge we have and be pragmatic about it and deploy those tools so we can keep functioning our venues. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Um, so I think Julie, maybe I'll just uh, talk a little bit about numbers and Omicron uh, before um, we get into the safety precautions with the venues that each panelist will talk about. Um, so whenever there is a new variant, um, or let's just call it a different flavor of the, of the virus, right? For simplicity, because then you start talking about variant species, it gets complicated. Um, what do we as infectious disease physicians worry about? Um, I'll tell you in my life, I'm, I, I see patients um, at, uh, at, our, at our clinical enterprise, and then I'm a faculty, we teach, we do research. And then um, with the pandemic, obviously my team and I have been central to a nonprofits and to other schools in the university. So we monitor it very carefully. Every time there is a new flavor, the things that we always wanna know about, is it more transmissible? Um, will the immunity that we get by virtue of natural infection and vaccination, will that immunity stand up to it? And lastly, the disease that it inflicts on us, is it more severe? Okay. Now, based on what we are seeing in South Africa, we are learning as we go. Um, I think we should acknowledge that comparing the landscape in South Africa and comparing the landscape here in California, it's, it's similar to comparing apples to oranges. A lot of difference, even between the age groups that are get, getting affected, the kind of vaccination that's been rolled out, the kind of precautions, and also the compliance and accessibility to vaccination. So is Omicron more transmissible than the ancestral strain? That the, that's the first strain we saw in March, 2020. Yes, it is. How much more? Much more. To give you a sense, um, let's talk about our primary, our first strain in March, 2020. Let's call it the ancestral strain. Then we got Delta. Delta variant was one and a half times more contagious, okay? Now, Omicron is about, I would say, actually, no, I stand corrected. Delta is about two and a half. And with Omicron, we are, we are talking about four times the ancestral strain, okay? Uh, does it escape our immunity that we may have acquired from vaccination or infection? It doesn't entirely escape it, but is definitely smarter than the variants or the flavors of uh, this virus that we have seen before this. And you may have seen some news uh, being shared that you know two Pfizer doses, uh, the amount of protection that you're getting with this variant is, is not great. So I wanna just not be an alarmist here and I think it's a good opportunity to put it in perspective. So we know that with two doses. We know mRNA vaccines are fortunately better than the other technologies that we have utilized for vaccination. And we have learned that with time, our immunity that is acquired by vaccination at least wanes with time. So it keeps becoming lower and lower. So when we started at 94%, when you talk about Delta at about 25 weeks, so let's just say six months, your protection against symptomatic, that is non-severe disease, when you get a cough or a cold and you don't have to be hospitalized, non-severe, it drops down to around 64%. 
when you take a third dose, that's against Delta, okay? When you take a booster, uh, I'm talking about immunocompetent people who have a good, who have a healthy immune system. It goes up to, I would say it goes up to 85%, you know? So there's, there's a jump, a significant jump. Even some studies showed it's north of 85, okay? Now with Omicron, what we are seeing is, um, you know, Pfizer published this data saying that around um, 12 weeks out after two doses, it drops to around 35%. Um, it's very prelim preliminary. Uh, I wouldn't take that to heart. But what I will say is that this is more invasive. It's more sneaky than Delta. And at six months, if with Delta, we drop to around 65%, we have definitely dropped more than that with Omicron with time, right? So booster becomes very important. What we have seen is that when you get a booster, uh, your immunity against Omicron goes up, okay? So it's important to take boosters. Do not, do not take a risk. And the protection, again, I emphasize is against non-severe disease. We continue, continue to have good protection against severe disease, though it has gone down compared to the ancestral strain. And now, now when you talk about Omicron, that's where all these things that we have learned and we'll talk about um, with the other panelists, that's where this comes in, you know, your masking, your testing, the venues, the ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. It becomes very important. And this will likely be the way of life. Um, Julie, I'm gonna stop. And uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> let's, uh, you know, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think it's why we saw, uh, if everyone was, you know, alerted to two days ago when the state of California just put new mandates into play today, that start today, that every, including offices, uh, all public spaces, you need to be masked. It's a mandate that we have to be masked now indoors at all public spaces. And then very specifically, they also have some um, changes to mega events, which is larger than a thousand um, indoors, uh, and that is to um, include one day for um, antigen tests and, and two day for PCR tests. Um, and you have to either be vaccinated or show proof of those um, and or the venue has to provide um, rapid tests at, at the site. Um, so, you know, we're seeing that the state is trying to address um, the obvious spread of this. I just read a thing that Metropolitan Opera, I don't know if everyone saw that today, that they just announced that they are going to require boosters for audiences and performers in um, starting by mid-January. So uh, <laughs> there's, there's continued moving parts. Um, and as we, as we try to live with this pandemic and specifically how do we operate our programs and our venues and our performances um, and work with the people we serve um, and provide services to uh, and keep them safe. And that's where we're um, really pleased to introduce some wonderful people who work in in the industry that we call arts, culture, and creative industries, um, and um, who have been um, dealing with this in their own ways, uh, in their own venues or in their programs. And we are, have, them, have them here to share today. So first I'd like to introduce Nara Hernandez, um, who is the visual arts director at um, Heart of LA. And uh, thank you and welcome Nara. And then we also have Donna Simone Johnson, who is the co-artistic director of the Watts Village Theater Company, among many other titles that she holds. Um, and their full bios, of course, are on the website as well. And then Brendan Farley, who's the VP of Operations at San Diego Theater. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you for being here this evening. Or it's it gets dark so early, it feels like we're all ready for bed. Um, so first I'm gonna start with Nara and, um, and Nara, you primarily work with, and you work with in youth programs, right? So tell us a little bit about um, your work, uh, your organization, what, who you serve, and then what are the best practices that you have learned in order to keep um, the people safe that come to your programs over the last, I guess it's, is it 20 months now um, that we've been in this and in order to, to do your work. So Nara, give us, give us a little bit of an overview if you would. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, Dr. Nanda for that um, refreshing and, and kind of frightening 
um, perspective. Um, it's, it's good. It's really good to be informed and um, really appreciate the work that you're doing in the field. Um, so, so again, I am the visual arts director of Heart of Los Angeles, OLA. Um, we have been an after-school program um, in the MacArthur Park, Westlake, Rampart neighborhood of Los Angeles, which is the most densely populated neighborhood in Los Angeles. And we've been here um, going on three and a half decades. Um, and our organization offers visual arts, music, academic, athletics, um, uh, and, and a multitude of other programs. So we're, we're basically like six different programs under one umbrella and each program has sort of its own challenges when it comes to um, COVID safety. Um, so, so the program that I run is the visual arts program. So we have a faculty of 14 professional teaching artists. We bring in um, a lot of guest artists to work with our youth as well. We have artist residencies. We're also working on a large scale public art um, community project in one of our local parks. Um, and we serve about, or the organization serves over 2000 kids a year, but um, my department serves about 300 students a year, about 100 classes, free classes. Um, and so we have, um, you know, we're in a densely populated area and we have a lot of, you know, different community members coming in and out of our space. Um, our youngest students are age six and our oldest students are alumni who are in their early 20s. Um, and so we're also kind of working with um, sort of, yeah, multitude of sort of age ranges and not everybody has the same access to vaccines at this point. Um, and so, so our work, our community has been probably one of the hardest hit communities in the country. Um, you know, the Westlake neighborhood, we have a lot of, a lot of, you know, um, immigrant families um, whose primary source of income is, um, you know, frontline workers, um, essential workers. Um, who don't have, you know, the best quality access to quality health care. Um, and um, the COVID rates have been extremely, extremely high. The infection rates, the death rates, and now we have an incredibly low, um, if you look at the county of Los Angeles as a whole, um, pretty low um, vaccination rate as well. And so we're working with a high risk community. So we wanna take every precaution, especially because it's kids um, living in you know, tight cramped apartments with multi-generational um, families. So we really have taken every precaution that we can. Um, so sort of our ultimate goal is to open up our spaces, both virtual um, and in-person and make sure they're impactful, they're welcoming and they're safe. So COVID has sort of posed a bunch of challenges, you know, in doing that. Um, it definitely was hard to build community for, you know, for a long time. Um, and now that we're back in person, we started back in person in the summer um, with a like 50-50 hybrid program. And now we're about 98% in person, 2% virtual. We wanna make sure that we're not closing the door on um, students that for some reason can't make it into our studio at this time. Um, so that kind of still expands, um, is helping us expand our reach, but we really miss the depth and the breadth of doing in-person programming. Um, like we all know, we all know, like you just can't, you can't duplicate things on Zoom that you can in person. Um, and so I think in terms of best practices, um, you know, we've learned so much over the, the last 20 months. And I think, you know, later on, we'll get into the nitty gritty of like the, the things that we're doing. But I think the most important things that sort of big picture things that I can pull of is um, stay informed, um, trust, you know, we've trusted our instincts. Like when something doesn't feel safe, it's probably not safe. Um, and, um, and just staying nimble. We've had to stay so nimble. We've had to reinvent what we do so many times. Um, you know, coming back in person, we weren't coming back. We weren't coming back to the same exact community in the same exact way. Like there was a lot of trauma um, 
that our community had faced and, you know, um, and we had to sort of come back, you know, and approach things really differently. And to, you know, to also lessen sort of the impact of the drama and, you know, make sure that everyone felt safe. I think that at the end of the day, we've sort of been a little bit more cautious um, than some of our peer organizations. Um, for example, when the county was like in the red zone, we operated in the purple zone. When it dropped down to the orange zone, we operated in the red zone. Um, so I think that was sort of, um, that was sort of sort of our approach that we chose. And um, we also set some policies before um, some of our peer institutions. Um, we decided to set a vaccination policy for um, all of our, our students that could be vaccinated. Um, sort of before the schools did it, before the county called it out. And it was super nerve wracking. It was like super nerve wracking. But I think the thing about policies is that they, they can always change. And it's good to have a safety net. And if these policies are wrong and we learn that they're wrong or we learn that there's a better way to do them, we can just rewrite them. Like, you know, but it's just good to have them. Um, and, and yeah, so that's sort of, sort of like our sort of approach sort of in a, in a sort of big picture approach to, um, to coming back in person and continuing to offer the quality program that, that we like to offer. Well, I think now more than ever, your, your programs and providing that to your community is, is so, so essential. So thank you for the work that you're doing and providing that safe space for people to meet. And we'll get back to some more details um, after every panel has a little bit of a chance to kind of give some overview. So thank you for starting us off. Um, Donna, I'm going to move to you, and um, I'm just in introducing you uh, in, in email exchange. Uh, we were talking about you've co-produced two shows during COVID um, and then appeared in three films, and you have just finished a run at the small, uh, at a, I guess, the Skylight Theater and are moving on to production at the Geffen. Is that, mm -hmm. yeah. is that correct? Okay. Yeah. So you've had a lot of different... Uh, Play, ways to be uh, a performer as well as a producer, right? An actress and producer in, in this. So tell us if you could, you know, sort of what your experience has been in this last 20 months um, and some of the, the sort of highlights that you would want to share um, at this moment in time. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I will say that uh, already I've learned so much and I'm like, I, my, my mind is definitely spiraling and like, how can we be better and how can we continue to support our communities and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, so the two films that were produced, um, they were with a company who had scheduled them in their season. Um, they were solo shows and then of course things happened and they decided to go digital with them. They were both filmed in theaters um, with no audience, a skeleton crew of about 12 people. Um, as producer, I was in charge of putting the 80 page COVID compliance plan for SAG AFTRA into place and learned a lot. Um, and of course, we also have what's called a, a COVID compliance officer on set as well, um, who's there to make sure that everything's being enforced. Um, I will say that overarchingly, from October 2020 to now, um, one thing that has not shifted at least in the spaces that i've been in is uh, a sense of empathy and respect and we have never i've never seen an issue with someone upset over wearing a mask or distancing and people forget and then you know a cco comes to separate but i really do believe that our community is so present not only here for ourselves in the art form but also the greater each other um and that's really important to me and you know as uh, artistic director of Watts Village Theater Company, we are in Watts. <laughs> and there has been such disparate experiences of living through the pandemic. You know, um, people talk about baking bread and having more time and that sort of thing. But these long standing inequities have only been exacerbated by, you know, by the pandemic. Um, and we don't get a lot of trickle down effects where we are. And so it's really been a community based effort. Um, you know, the students that we work with and mentor who we typically make theater for or have uh, after school programs for 
a lot of these collaborators are um, they don't they didn't have a lot of free time right um, we work with nurses and grocery store workers and those who work for the city people who didn't stay home but they had kids who did you know we had quite a few um, young artists who did not have access to wi-fi so they couldn't go to school but even if they could their parents needed their help because they lost workers to go to work with them um, we have students who come to the theater and have joined the theater to avoid standing on the corners avoid meeting up in parks and we had to try to get creative about how to continue to make those spaces safe for them while also being within the guidelines of, of CDC and then also socially what's acceptable. Um, and that community in particular has been really difficult. Um, you know, we have these conversations about expanding digital access and so much work has gone into film and, and Zoom and that sort of things. But I continue to think about those who've been barred from access to begin with and what that means. Those kids who don't have access to that sort of thing or, you know, we have at some point we ended up extending our Wi-Fi and we had kids who were just sitting on cars on their computer because at least then they could, you know, do their homework or what have not. I can't imagine if they wanted to watch Shakespeare in love or something, you know what I mean? And, and try to really enjoy a, a, any sense of art, not only theater, but just any sort of media, how difficult that was during that process. Um, so when, we, when, when I look over, aside from the production, and we'll get to those technical things about venues, and I'm sure, Brendan, you have very similar things because you're also in the theater. You know, aside from that, um, I have learned that so little of what we do has to do with performing. And I think we know that in a way where we communicate that, but, you know, our, um, our organization has historically been wary um, of things like vac vaccination, and we do have a pretty high vax hesitancy rate. Um, and so I don't know what the tomorrow looks like for us. Um, we are very, very much still in a pandemic, and a lot of people are operating as if we weren't. Um, and those who are now unmasked were never really masked to begin with, you know, and I'm okay calling my students out that way. Um, so I don't know. It's actually uh, pretty, I don't want to say desolate, but it feels that way sometimes about what the tomorrow looks like for those who are already under-resourced, um, those uh, marginalized communities. Um, but I have seen a lot of citizen art practices in place instead. Um, and that goes from people making murals on the street just to have something to do afterwards, right? You can do that mask and distance. We've had a lot of performances in the park. We made a couple of block parties. We had vaccination stations, community events, things like that, getting really creative. And what we do at the heart, aside from all the technical stuff, is about empathy and connection. And that is what that's why we had people tuning in on Zoom to watch Zoom Box Theater to be connected. And I'm so proud of our community that we've been able to do that in spite of so many different barriers. So I will also say and we'll get into this, but access makes all the difference in the world. Not only am I unsure about what's going to happen tomorrow based on COVID and, and some of the um, residual effects of that, but also economically, fiscally, we 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 weren't great to begin with and now we are really struggling you know but going from a small 99 seat theater company like skylight theater you know where um they they we had to employ a COVID compliance officer and they sort of also made them an intern slash assistant stage manager slash simply because they couldn't afford anything else the COVID officer cost five times literally five times what the actors cost um and to, to a place like the Geffen, where we test three times a week there, because UCLA is right there. Um, and it doesn't seem like they've really made a lot of adjustments because they have this space in which they don't have to. They're not looking at lower ticket sales, really, um, because they already have an 800, 800 seat space. But if you've got 99 seat, you're looking at 30%. That's a further economic hit. So I don't want to take up too much time, but Yes, thank you for listening to this. <laughs> no, Donna, it's super and so important in terms of what you're talking about uh, with access and the and uh, you know the 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 highlight of what the pandemic has brought in terms of inequities and um, and and how this actually though in this case is resulting in literally people dying because of the inequities. And so I think that that uh, you know we can't we can't 
we can't underscore enough how important that is to continually talk about that. And in our case, we talk about that to policymakers uh, in terms of making sure that that access is there, the funding and the investment is there for these communities in particular. Um, and uh, that that, you know, that we can, that if we don't acknowledge that, then we're never going to get we're never going to see that change, right? So we, we absolutely have to. So th so thank you for for sharing very openly and honestly what what you're seeing in your own community. It's very very important. So thanks for that. And we will get into more specifics about what you've experienced as a performer as well, because I think it's really important. Um, and I wanted to introduce now Brendan Farley, who's the uh, vice president of operations at San Diego Theaters. They have two theaters, um, and. Uh, and both are considered, I guess, um, the mega event size. So you have some pretty serious things that you have to do every every event. Um, so Brendan, if you can give us an overview of like what's happened for the San Diego theaters over these last twenty months, how have you um, had to the, the you know the pivot and the adapt uh, that we talk about all the time, um, and what are some of the highlights of and best practices that you know you want to uh, share with with folks that are tuning in today. Absolutely. Thanks, Julie. Uh, and thank you to the, the folks who have already shared my, my little artistic brain is jumping out of, you know, uh, so you, hearing, hearing about your experiences and then comparing them to my own has, like, I am on the kind of the, the swing, the swing of it because the, the venues that we're operating are, are much larger and, uh, from an organizational standpoint, uh, a lot of the things that we were uh, we were kind of working through uh, through the closure, and then now as part of the reopening, it, it, they're just it, they're different. They're they're different. Uh, so we we closed uh, March twentieth. Um, so we operate two venues, as you said, Julie. Uh, one is the San Diego Civic Theater, which is a 3000 seat theater. And uh, the other is the Balboa theater, which is a 1300, uh, 1330 uh, seat venue. And uh, so we closed March 20th of 2020, and remained closed until August 2nd of 2021. Uh, during that time, we went from about 225 paid employees down to 18. Uh, and only nine of which were actually working full time. Uh, the other, uh, the other. Let's see if I can keep doing math here. Uh, the other nine, we are we are all on a fifty percent furlough, and uh, that that restart uh, basically started in April of bringing people back uh, and really looking at how we were going to be able to do that in a very new way. Uh, over the closure, we had put in some uh, infrastructure changes. A lot of the, the bigger spaces where there was so much talk about HVAC and so much talk about filters. And I, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I learned the ukulele during uh, COVID because I would sit on Zoom call after Zoom call with a ukulele in my lap, trying to stay sane because of all of this kind of like, information that I was having to take in. Uh, and what we ended up doing was because we have older buildings, we were not able to uh, bring in HEPA filters. So we went with a bipolar ionization system that offers some charged ions, which is supposed to kind of collect dust and other particles in the air, uh, including the kind of the the COVID virus and the idea is that it disrupts the outside of the virus and then it exposes it and kills it. I'm not sure 100% what that effectiveness rate is, but the air is is cleaner in our venues uh, and really kind of working through what that is gonna mean. So uh, we are continuing to look at our HVAC uh, from a capital improvement standpoint, but a change in a greater sense would be in the millions of dollars. Uh, the ongoing efforts then uh, about 
socially distanced seating, all of these things and the economic impact that was, that was going to have with our company, uh, that we would have had to remain small, hearing other companies having to go through this same thing. Uh, it, I should also say that we do not uh, produce any theater. We do not create any art in that respect. Uh, we are a touring, touring venues. Uh, we do present, uh, but we do not produce. So we were not trying to create anything while we were closed. What we were trying to do is how to operate. Uh, we were trying to figure out how to operate. And uh, when the reopening guidance came out in April with that June 15th landmark of coming back and like the, the roadmap to reopening, uh, we were gonna be able to reopen at 100%. Uh, so then, uh, which was great news, we, we, we kind of progressed through the hiring. We've had a hard time bringing back the number of staff that we typically operate with. Uh, we had a little bit of, we, we wanted to extend our community outreach. So we started looking at volunteers uh, rather than all paid staff to operate. Uh, and we reopened on August 2nd with a Joe Bonamassa concert, which is a, he's a kind of a, a blues guitar player. Um, and it looked remarkably normal. <laughs> uh, there was no COVID checks in place. Uh, we did have bag checks. There was no mask mandate at that point. The mega event threshold was still at 5,000 people. And so it was all of a sudden very normal. Uh, on, I think, August 15th, that guidance changed for a, for a, a shift on September 20th that was going to have that lowered the threshold to a thousand people. And then we would have to do a, a, a COVID check for a negative, negative test within 72 hours, did not specify antigen or PCR or a proof of vaccine. So uh, we had a handful of events prior to that event we did not make an organizational policy. Uh, so it was really interesting uh, to hear you, Nara, talk about how uh, you, you were operating one level above because you had such a, your population and demographic that you were dealing with. And, and with Donna, the COVID compliance for producing is so intense. It's absolutely so intense uh, that we, because that we weren't in that world. We were like CDC, state of California. If the artist wants to come in or the presenter wants to come in with a higher guideline, great. We're going to live at this baseline. So as of September 20th, uh, we added COVID checks. So now our, our how do you have to go to get into our venue? You have to go through a COVID check and then a bag check and metal detectors. And then you get your ticket scanned and then you come in. Uh, as of today, uh, there's a mask mandate inside. Prior to this, we were living in this kind of very odd world of self-attestation. That's a new word uh, where if you were vaccinated, uh, you were recommended to wear a mask. But if you were unvaccinated, you were required. Uh, again, organizationally, we did not try to mark people. So once you came in, we did not, we did not have any mask. Like we, people were encouraged to wear them, but we did not push it unless the presenter did. So we had Broadway San Diego was one of our partners. Uh, they operate Broadway tours across the country. Actors Equity, very high standards, COVID compliance, three testing three times a week, the whole thing, and a mask mandate inside the house. So that from an operational standpoint was put onto our staff to be able to make sure people were, were doing that. Uh, patrolling, patrolling is probably a strong word, but at least moving through the house, you know, with signs, asking people to raise their masks. Um, and at that point, I think we were first starting to see that uh, for every comment that we had about, this is ridiculous, we would get a second comment that said, you're not doing enough. And so people are really kind of still very split down the middle. Uh, I think what we have learned that it is about trying to communicate as much as we can, 
that communication starts with uh, a ticket purchase, uh, having a health check that pops up on the screen that says, if you're going to purchase a ticket for this event, this is what we're, this is going to be the requirements. Uh, know before you go, emails going out. And then once they come on site, having staff members up front along with signage that are just constantly kind of reminding people of what to expect. Now with the mask mandate, we're really going to be leaning on our food and beverage people to put that mat, that, that communication as well. Because what we were also finding was like, the old here, I'll, I have a can here. I'll just do it. Oh, no, I'm, I'm still drinking. I'm still drinking. I don't have to put my mask up. You know, uh, our CEO, Carol Wallace, was very specific that she did not want to put our staff in any sort of confrontational standpoint. So a lot of what we talk about is de-escalation, uh, trying to be able to talk to somebody and kind of not reason with them, but just basically how, how, do we, how do we find that empathy? Because we are a theater. I mean, people are coming to connect. So understanding that even though we might be disagreeing or there might be some escalated emotions about this because of everything that's happening outside our walls, inside, we still have to be a community and we have to create that community. So a lot of what I do is really kind of step into those situations where it may be getting out of hand or people, you know, might be getting a, a little hot about something and really try to like bring it all back down, understanding that the show, you came here to see the show. That's what we want to do. Uh, so I think that in a nutshell, kind of before, it, I, we certainly can talk a lot more about operational things, but that's really um, how we fit into this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. It's, it's really interesting to have all three of you um, speak to how much of your role has also just not, I mean, uh, Adana, as you spoke to, I mean, that is what the arts do, right, is, is try to generate compassion and build empathy and bring people together. Um, but how, how critical that is in terms of what this, about it, living through a pandemic and how important it is that that's there. And so we understand why our, what our role is, but how now it's shifted in terms of even having to talk to people about vaccine hesitancy, right? But, you know, you, you all of a sudden you're, you're all in, in different, you know, that you never thought that you'd have to become experts. Uh, and we're not, Dr. Nanda's the expert, um, <laughs> but we're here to, um, you're, 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 you are that connecting point for so many people in your own, in, in terms of who you serve. And that we talk a lot about that in terms of our advocacy to, to policymakers also, and how, important the arts are in terms of trusted community partners and, um, and why you know, we should be uh, open in the sense to, to support that kind of messaging as well, right? Um, and, and making those connections. So Dr. Nanda, you know, I was originally gonna ask you because we started this series what, in October, mm -hmm. uh, Delta was just kind of coming big on the scene and that was like, oh boy, okay, good thing we're calling it living with pandemic. Um, now we got Omicron, um, and, um, and so I was going to say, and then we got the mask mandate <laughs> that came out. So I was going to ask you, um, will it ever be safe? You know, can, when, when will it be safe to go maskless? Right? Like that was sort of like, a, because I think we all, I've been at many events where, you know, they're walking around with the sign saying, put on your mask. I mean, it's, it's a lot to kind of manage people wearing masks, right. Um, for all these venues and all your programs. But now I guess I'm going to ask you the question, will it ever be safe to go massless? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, this is uh, the, 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 the simple answer is nobody knows. Right. Uh, and, you know, Julie, I want to build on what you asked, listening to all our panelists stories. I have to wonder uh, first of all, let me tell you, everybody has become an expert um, in infectious disease. Everybody's gotten now 101 in infectious disease. And I'll tell you the one thing that's come out of this pandemic is there are so many industries where we've seen this cross-pollination, including my own. I, I would never imagine working with Julie or meeting you guys. Uh, I mean, being on a panel with all of you. Um, and so, so I think all of us, irrespective of the industry we are in, 
there is this sense of fatigue. And then in some situations, we are people who are shepherding our groups. So I heard each one of you, and I can tell that on a spectrum of resilience um, or how long can we sustain this, uh, it seems very difficult. And I'm almost thinking that a question that we should answer is if we know for the safety of everyone, we have to sustain a few things. And when I think about what is it that we definitely want to sustain and hold on to, and what are we going to let go? Because at the end of it, we do have to function normally, as normal as we can get. And with that, that's where your mask question comes in, Julie. How long are we going to hold on to mask? I'll wait to answer that. But what I'll say is, one thing that we have to, I think, really build on is something that's not behavioral, right? So, and then I've, and I've learned this in a way in my world is whenever you want to, so my, my day job is keeping, seeing patients and keeping people safe in healthcare settings. We generally gravitate towards investing our time and resources into something that is not based on behavior for obvious reasons. So now when you talk about this in the outside world or in a world that is non-healthcare, um, vaccination. You take it once, you're safe for a while. Uh, and that's where this vaccine hesitancy, everybody's on a different spectrum. So that is something that is going to stay. Um, and the other thing, everything that's objective, so something like testing, having a low threshold of including that in operations when resources allow is something we want to think about. The last thing is, you know, ventilation again, but not every place. Uh, our center has worked with various cultural arts avenue, uh, venues, and it's a challenge. It's not easy, like some of you alluded to. It's easy for someone to say at a policy table, you know, get your air, air exchanges at dash per hour, you know, six air exchanges per hour. No, it's not easy. Okay, we've been through it in several reiterations and troubleshooting with them. It's not easy. But things like vaccination, things like testing, hopefully with time, we will have access to tests. Um, you know, and hopefully the insurance will be able to pay. That's where the Biden administration is going with it. Uh, we will be able to access that. Now, masking, because it's so behavioral, there are so many layers around it, the type of mask then how well are you wearing it? How well are you caring for the mask that you're wearing? All that at the end of it decides how effective that mask is. And, you know, there are some things that we'll definitely want to hold on to, everything that's objective, or, you know, which is attached to a number or gives you some kind of uh, protection. That's your vaccine and testing. Mask as much as we want to hold on to, I think that'll go up and down or in and out based on the prevalence in your area. And I think, how do we tie all of this together? You know, we, we in our group spent a lot of time thinking about, it's easy to say you're going to live with the virus. How are we going to empower people to really live with the virus? And that's where conversations like this are so important. And that's how we've actually now created a new field, if you think about it, of information literacy. How do you identify that the person who's speaking with you is truly credible, right? And that is just what we have learned. You really want to be able to find people or resources or groups that give you credible information. And they're not being alarmist. They are not being very cavalier about it. Um, but that's the only way we, that's one of the big tenets we came up with. That, you know, credible resources is what is really going to allow us to continue operations. So, um, yeah, Julie, I'll, I'll let you chime in, please. Yeah, yeah. no, it's very, really critical. And I think, Dr. Nan, if you have credible resources that you think, um, you know, you would share with us, please do. Um, and um, either, you know, we can send us out to everybody. Um, as a you know, place that you can look to, because uh, I think resources are really important. 
But I want to go to our panelists too and, and get down to some specifics. I'm just going to ask you guys all the same question and maybe you can just sort of jump in or I'll call, I'll call on you however you want to do it. But, you know, so a lot of what we talked about um, in, in preparing for this is, is best practices, right? That we want to share because now we're, we're in this and we've learned a lot. So if you could share some of the greatest strategies, tactics, policies, procedures, plans that you have developed um, over this course of time that you wished you had known when you first reopened, like what is it, what is it you really have learned that you're like, this is it, like this is what we know for sure if we had thought about, if we had done then, you know, so who wants to, to jump in first? Uh, how about Nara? Do you want to share what you... Oop, uh, the dreaded unmute. We learned that. <laughs> there you Alrighty. go. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I mean, I think the thing is, um, I think I'll jump in with our vaccination policy. So I think that there was a lot of hesitation um, to put a vaccination policy, you know, uh, sort of a blanket vaccination policy. We were afraid that we were going to lose students. Um, we were afraid that we were going to sort of alienate families and um, that were vac vaccination hesitant. And also, you know, kids don't have a choice. Like it's up to their parents. And um, I've run across families where a kid wants to be vaccinated, but their parents won't let them. So we don't want those kids that aren't vaccinated to become invisible. You know, we want to make sure that they're still getting access to quality programming. And so I think we were really, I think we were really scared to do it. But once we did it, it worked. You know, it just worked. Um, we did lose a few students. Um, I had one student whose mom was very vaccination hesitant. And um, after being out of our program for two months, he just showed up and he was like, I got my first vaccine. Um, you know, so like I'm seeing the second wave of sort of some of the vaccine hesitant things. And I think that's sort of the push with LAUSD. Um, but it's, it's taken us a lot to get there. We had to have, I mean, I think the, the sub theme of this meeting is um, empathy and connection. Um, thank you, Donna, for putting that out there. And, <laughs> you know, um, and Brendan for reiterating it. Like, I think that, um, we had to do a lot of groundwork. You can't just say get vaccinated and expect, you know, um, marginalized communities to go get vaccinated. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of historical reasons why, why they don't want to get vaccinated. And so, um, and so we had to just do a lot of groundwork. We hosted town halls, we brought in experts. Like, again, we're, we're, we're all like, you know, freshmen when it comes, you know, like the 101 course um, level. So we all know, you know, a little bit, um, about prevention, but we're not experts. So we brought in a lot of experts to speak to our families. Um, we did a visual campaign as well. We, we um, teamed up with Amplifier and have like a giant banner that's like, you know, one story banner hanging off from one of our buildings um, that is, you know, um, you know, a call for families and communities to be vaccinated. Um, and we, you know, we build a lot of trust. So one of the, the benefits of being an organization where we have kids come every week is that we have the ability to build trust and we can leverage that trust um, in order to sort of um, help these families sort of navigate the healthcare system. We also hosted our own vaccine clinics. So we've hosted three vaccine clinics on our site. Um, our vaccine policy is only 12 plus. Um, and we're gonna make it five plus um, soon, but we're waiting for full FDA approval of the vaccine or for our leather, another large institution like LAUSD to go ahead and say five plus. Um, and so we are letting our families know, like you have to just communicate, communicate, communicate and have open communication. And we're letting them know, while we don't have a vaccination policy for five plus, be expecting one, you know? And when it comes, you have 45 days, we will help you get there. Here are some resources, you know? Um, uh, so I think it's it's just, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot of groundwork um, to get to where we've gotten, but in the end, um, 
we we basically have like 98% compliance um, in a community that has very, very low um, vaccination rate. Well, I would say that's a, a huge success story um, and actually something I'm probably gonna talk to you about because those are the stories we wanna share actually to our policymakers on why the arts are so critical for our community's safety and health. Um, Donna, would you, sh and, and education so important, communication, thank you for all of those you know, highlights and, and some of the specifics on how you did that. Donna, would you share some of the strategies, policies, procedures, and also specifically as an artist, as, as the performer, um, like what were the things that you saw um, in, in the work that you've been doing in these last 20 months? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to say to, to, to follow what you were saying, Nara, I've noticed that, um, in, I, that uh, compliance is the rate is higher in under-resourced communities and places than not. And that's a really veiled way of saying that some of the poorer places, they want to show up because they have a lot to risk. And some of the other places, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and not to call anyone out, but I'm going to call someone out. You know, um, when I was working at the smaller theater, uh, I shared the role with another actor because if something happened, we could switch out interchangeably. Um, and uh, now working at the Geffen, I do not have an understudy, which is fascinating because we're running for two and a half months. Um, and I, I asked the artistic director who I, and he said it's actually cheaper to cancel performances than it is to hire an understudy. And what I heard is I'm willing to, to risk you getting sick, right? And not covering that and then making you possibly feel the guilt or whatever, you know, emotional, um, rever rever reverb of that than to provide help. So that was a thing. But um, in terms of technical things, um, I will say that the films produced, I agree with you, I also say pre and post vaccine. And so the films that I worked on were all pre vaccine. Um, and uh, we have really strict guidelines. Um, theater live performance was one of the last things to come back um, and will be one of the first things to go. And so I've heard a lot in different sets and theaters, what is the cost? You know, what is the cost of you wearing a mask, of you distancing, of you following the rules? You might lose your job. You might lose the opportunity to come to the theater. You might lose the donation that you gave big donor, et cetera, et cetera, right? But if you're able to follow these guidelines together, we can have nice things, essentially. And I've seen people react well to that. Um, but uh, yeah, we have all the basic um, procedures in place, the, the, the we mask, social distancing, sanitization, all of that. Um, some new unique things is uh, we have what's called pods or zones. And so uh, whether you're in theater or in film, um, the actors, sometimes the directors are their own pod, and then you have the designers and you have everyone else. And there are limits to how far you can go in the theater. For example, um, after shows, you can no longer greet artists. And if you do, it has to be off the theater's premises, right? They're not responsible for. There's no more audience interaction. You can't walk down the aisles and sing a song. None of that anymore. Um, they do ask that they distance audience members two or three seats by groupings, although you can't really in, um, uh, enforce what a grouping is. It could be people who just came together, right? But that's what they're trying to do, you know, cover as much space as possible. Um, and then there are, I mean, financially, you know, it's things like if you have to provide craft services, the difference between being able to order for everyone or order individually packaged meals that everyone has to have to stand outside and eat in the parking lot, that sort of thing. I really do, and I think a lot of my colleagues feel the same way. These are like, these are small sacrifices to make, right? In order to be able to do what we, what we love and we've been unable to do it for so long that again, I, I, I haven't run into any issues um, as a producer. Um, as a performer, well, the first show that I did live was, uh, we opened the top of November and this next one will be the top of February. Um, and the show in November, we had pods and all of that. They, over time, things get lax because we're being tested. Um, and we're all vaccinated. There is a, a, a total vax policy for uh, patrons and performers, artists, anyone there. Um, and I, I thought the other day, you know, if I get tested on Wednesday, come in on Friday, but on Thursday went to a bar, right, showed the vaccination, the person next to me had COVID, we both had our drink like this. I'm just thinking of all the ways in which 
not things can go wrong, but all the ways in which we can't control this, right? This idea that everyone will get it at some point. Um, our best bet is to be vaccinated and mask and do all you can, but you can do everything right and still, right? And how much it behooves us as a community to at least try to do everything right, right? If you don't study, you'll get an F. If you study, you might get a D, but you also might get an A. Let's try for the A. Um, and these are analogies that I use on my, to all my kids, essentially, <laughs> to help connect the dot. It's not about you. Um, but yes, uh, as a performer, it's so strange. Uh, everything, everything that I do has to do with large gatherings of people, intimate gatherings of people. It is strange to try to act a scene without seeing an actor's mouth, right? You can't really hear them. It is so strange to not be able to hug your director coming in and that sort of thing. Um, it's strange to be staggered. In other words, I can be called at 2.30, but someone else can't be called until 2.45 because we have to come in and be checked out and assessment and all of that stuff. All of that is new and different, but I have a five-year-old, you might hear him, I have a five-year-old and they've adapted so well. He was three when COVID, when, when COVID came and um, he used to be, I don't want to wear a mask, I don't want to do that. And now it's normative. You know, he goes to birthday parties, the kids wear masks, they can hear each other, they can learn each other. They're also learning emotions by watching face. They're picking all of that up. They're doing, they're running, they're doing just fine because we are adaptable creatures. And I think our best bet for theater continuing to be adaptable is for us to adapt. <laughs> Absolutely. If I may add yeah. to what Donna, you know what you just mentioned, this generation of students or children, what they'll have is we did not have resilience. It is pretty impressive if you think about it in some ways. You can call so them things to make right? them resilient. Course, happening you, call them, you call them fortunate or unfortunate, <laughs> but they have witnessed something that uh, many of us didn't. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it, it sounds though, I mean, from what you're saying, Donna, as a performer, the the there's so many restrictions, but they're but by and large, it really is keeping you safe. And as, as a performer, I welcome yeah. all of them and yeah. none of them have been an, an inconvenience, right? Things yeah, are like, yeah. oh, that's kind of a bummer. As a producer, there are a lot of things. As someone who runs a theater company and creates a theater company, I mean, like, like I started by saying, all of that is really daunting. But I do want to say that as someone who has produced theater and also been in theater and been a patron in indoor theater, it's totally doable. It's feasible that not only can we do this, but we could probably do this for a couple of years in order to maintain the gift that we have, which is connecting in person with these events and experiences. Yep, yep. that's terrific. Thank you for sharing that. So Brennan, to you, um, from operator large venue perspective, what are the things that you put into place that you would say now are like the most important things that you, know, you wish you had known from the very beginning? Uh the, the biggest thing, uh, which I, I re <laughs> consistently refer to as the great de-escalator, uh, was having on-site testing um, when, that, uh, when that September 20th kind of requirement came in, when we were then uh, considered a mega event space. Um, we did not do it immediately, and uh, we had what I also then classify as uh, one of the toughest demographics to deal with um, for a band called Get the Let Out. So our, our, our demographic was uh, probably 45 to 65 year old white men. And uh, so they were coming in hot. They did, they were very excited about the concert. And all of a sudden, you know, Somebody didn't read their emails, that somebody didn't get an email, someone didn't know there was this requirement, someone, how dare we do this? And like just this explosion, explosive rage kind of coming at the staff, um, which was really hard, which was, which was unexpected. Um, we had had events prior to that that, that had not been an issue. Um, so what we immediately did was um, I got on the horn with some, with some kind of concierge testing companies uh, that 
really were specifically dealing with travel or in-person meetings. Um, and we found this great company uh, down here in San Diego, very small um, and uh, it's called Lux. Uh, <laughs> and the, the operator, uh, Monet Williams has just been an, an amazing partner. And she, she has kind of rounded up a crew of nurses so that they are on site for every event. The, the cost is passed to the, to the guest that shows up that needs a test. Um, but she dropped the rate significantly. A concierge test usually costs over $100. For us on site, it's $35. So it's, um, we didn't advertise it because we didn't want to overwhelm it. And we really wanted to have people bring that. But um, we saw such a dip. San Diego is in like the 80% vaccinated range. So we saw such a dip from the beginning of October where we were doing up to 40 tests at every event. The highest one we did at the Civic was for a Carol G concert. Uh, so a much younger demographic. And that was, we did a hundred tests at that event. Um, on only one positive. So we've only had two positives the entire time we've tested and we've tested thousands and thousands of people. So that's a huge, huge benefit. Um, what do you do when the person tests positive? Obviously. We walk away slowly, <laughs> slowly. Uh, no, I get to talk to them. It's the best, it's the best. They're like, Brendan, you're on, buddy. And I'm like, okay, here we go. So this uh, is where you learn how to de-escalate when you're exactly, the one sharing exactly. you hey, positive for COVID. You know, the, the Carol G one's kind of funny. It was a it was a it was a younger woman. She was with somebody and uh, she didn't even have a ticket to the event yet. She was she had like won a radio contest and was like meeting somebody from the radio station. So I I, I was like, I went up, I said introduced myself uh, just to let you know, you know, your test came back positive. So you wouldn't be allowed into the event. Um, can I take your name and information down? I'll go over to the box office, et cetera. She was like, Oh, I don't have a ticket. I was like, what? <laughs> so, We're just offering random tests now. Yeah. Oh. Anna, did you want to say something? I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Just a no. quick question. Do you require that people purchase tickets ahead of time? So you have a, a account or no? Oh, uh, typically we do. Like, every, I mean, uh, if someone was going through the steps to come into the venue, they would have already had a ticket. Uh, our ticket offices are located outside the venues, so they would have access to that. So, um, but this was like into the, they were in line to come in, right? Uh, so she was just kind of waiting. She was going to get a text from the representative from the radio station or something like that. Um, but we do kind of like, I specifically talk to them. Uh, and then, you know, try to triage their party the best that I can. If, if there's other people in the group, a lot of times, if there's like four people in a group, three will be vaccinated, one will be not. Or if it's two couples, we might have a couple that's vaccinated and a couple that is, you know, that's kind of like what we've seen a lot. Um, but it's, it's very rarely a fully unvaccinated party. Um, we also get a lot of people from Arizona, but we've seen vaccine cards from different countries, a ton, a lot of, a lot of folks from Mexico down here, uh, which is great. We're trying to serve as many people as we possibly can. Um, a hmm. couple of things, uh, Dr. Nanda, is it, is it, is it Nanda? When you were talking about like what we could, um, like what we could, uh, take and I, Donna, you just touched on it. Like uh, what I love about being an arts organization is that we will, we will adapt because I think the, the closure and, and what we had to go through and to what we're going through to get back, um, I see it from every, everyone who has come back to work that it is about like being able to do this. It's the stagehands who, you need us to be vaccinated, we're vaccinated. It's, you know, front, frontline people, like we will do whatever it takes. That's just my personal opinion because how important it is from a community standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint. So that's where I kind of approach this work. And uh, there's a question in the, in the chat, I think that talks about from an organizational standpoint, how have we dealt with our employees? Um, we have two levels of employee. Uh, I don't say two levels. We have two different kind of buckets that em employees fall into. We have our administrative staff, 
who are office workers primarily, um, and some of us kind of go between, and the other bucket is all frontline staff. So uh, we were at a pink martini con. We had pink martini last night, which was it was fantastic. I, they've been at other venues throughout California. They're on like a they closed a two week tour, so uh, almost sold out. We had about uh, thirteen hundred. We had twelve hundred people in last night, and uh, I would say about sixty five to seventy percent of them were unmasked at the event. So that can put a lot of people off, right? We, we just canceled our employee party that we we're gonna have in January because of the current concern. Because, but there's, there was 40 of us working last night inside the theater with all of those unmasked people. So there's a, there's a level of risk that I believe that we're taking on and a level of uh, discomfort that I think that some of us are compartmentalizing, some of us are just kind of living with it, and some people aren't. Some people do are, are very uncomfortable and they are stepping back. Um, and it's trying to deal with that on both sides. Like we need to be masked. We have a vaccination policy for our staff. Uh, so we, we are very tight about that with our own people. Uh, but when someone makes the choice to step back, that is met with you know as, as much grace and gratitude as we can uh, to be able to say, yes, that is the right choice for you. And we, we appreciate you making that choice because our main job at this point is to, is to bring people into the venue so that they can have the experience that they are seeking, which is typically on stage or with the community of people that they are around. We do different shows almost every night where that community changes. We go from different demographics. So, so people are coming into that community It's uh, by choice. And so we have to kind of like move with that and be dynamic with it. Uh, again, what we have done is we have asked our staff to be leaders among leaders. So that is, um, with each other to be able to hold each other accountable in a different way than they may have in the past. Uh, with our guests to be able to display proper behavior, to display greetings and smiles and all of the positive things about being together. Uh, but it also means that we have to hold them accountable in a different way. Uh, and we are trying to practice that with this empathy and compassion, which I think is the theme of the call, right? Uh, so to be able to do that from uh, a large scale uh, is difficult. There's no, I mean, it's just absolutely difficult because jobs have changed. Our, uh, like being an usher is, is different than it was, you know? That's a, that is a difficult job to begin with. And now to kind of put all this other stuff into it, but it's really trying to like, that we need we need that leadership and it's and it's not heavy-handed like we're not we're, like we can't be in that in that that method at this point it's everything's too everybody's too on edge you know too on edge so absolutely so now as of today though everyone has to be masked oh yeah yeah so that was it man they squeaked <laughs> under and uh i i was i actually i i was a little delayed coming on to this call uh because i was basically returning an email from, from a woman who had been at the show, who had heard the announcement on Monday and was, yeah. was so irate and saddened because that's really what it is. I mean, we, we had, there's so much, some of this anger that comes out. I mean, it's just, it's fear, it's sadness, it's, it's sometimes desperation, but it comes across as anger. So trying to like respond to this email being of like, this was supposed to be this way, your staff was doing nothing about it. And, and yeah, I was like, it wasn't like, it didn't come into place until today. You know, so yesterday was different. It's a brand new world, you know, come and back tomorrow and we'll be, in, everybody will be masked. It'll be great. And that is what we've learned, right? We have to be aware of all these uh, changing conditions. Yeah. But I mean, I'm, I think the de-escalation de techniques, which, I mean, I used to run a venue and I understand even before COVID you had 
that with customers sure. when you're dealing with humans, but it's at such a heightened level today that I think that that is something that is probably a really important training mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> that all of us probably need to um, consider um, in, the, in terms of the work that mm-hmm. what we're doing. Um, Dr. Nana, did you want to say something? I, I wanted to- uh, You know, I liked yeah. what Brandon was touching on. I'm, I'm, give me a sense of where on a spectrum are people in different groups with this thought um, that the more we do upfront, similar to what uh, one of us shared, I think it was Nara, that very conservative, they, t- you know, the more we do upfront, the more smooth operations we will have. Now, when I heard Nara talk about it, they have adopted the approach of being very conservative and cautious, which is fair because we are all a part of a natural experiment, so to speak. They've decided that they don't want to be a part of that or you know, they want to be a part of it, but they want to be at the periphery. And so they are operating one level more conservative, you know, purple, red, however. So do you think in your organizations, people buy into this, that the more it's very inconvenient to do all that you're doing, that the more you do upfront, the return, the return on investment is so high that perhaps it's worth the inconvenience. And I did hear from Donna also kind of saying that it probably is at a personal level. Um, but what do you think about the communities that you're in? Does that echo with them? Or it's just inconvenient and it's coming in the way and it's just not going away? I, Anyone can go first. Yeah, go ahead, please. I mean, um, again, I, I work in a, in, a, in a bevy of different environments. Um, I will say that as... AD of Watts Village, I, I am uh, less diplomatic than you are, Brendan. Um, but also, you know, I had an older woman say to me, um, I don't understand how now they figured out free health care so they can have a, a kiosk in every corner to give me a shot. But and but ordinarily, you know, and, and his wife died of cancer last year. And I didn't have anything to say to him. I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I, I think when it <laughs> Um, I didn't have a lot to say about the film sets because of that, because we did prepare in advance, right? And everyone knows the expectation. And so if you're disappointed it happened before we saw you, we had those interactions. Um, And I will say that when it comes to the shows that we've done, uh, our unions have really strict guidelines that we've got to follow for sag after and for equity. And equity was particular to Southern California and they waited until the very last minute to be to allow us to be indoors. And so before we're following CDC guidelines even, we're following those. And um, just like Nara was saying, those operate at a higher level. Um, and I think that generally speaking, it's they've kept things pretty smooth. I mean, you haven't heard of huge outbreaks on sets, right? Um, the Broadway tour of Aladdin did have to shut down because of a COVID-19 uh, uh, outbreak, but those seem to have been pretty rare. I mean. Uh, the film industry opened December, December, November 2020, and they all through Delta, they did pretty OK. So I would agree that that's yes. Yeah, that's a good observation. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions. Oh, Nara, go ahead. No, jump in. Jump I was in. just going to say, I think that for um, our families, I think the inconvenience of having to align themselves with all of our protocol is a lot less than in the inconvenience of not having after school programming. And so I think it's sort of this option, like, do you wanna to go to this concert or do you, you know, like, you know, what's worse, like wearing your mask and going to a concert or staying home and not wearing a mask, you know? It's like, it's people having to make those choices. And I think there's also something to say about critical, critical mass. And I think it's like, it's really hard when we're in this sort of in between phases and, and everyone's trying to figure out like, what, you know, what are we gonna do? But um, I think that when, when sort of these guidelines become statewide, um, there's, there's less questioning it, um, I think, and there's, there's less options. So people kind of just jump on the bandwagon. Um, so, I mean, I think that at least that's what we've seen in our little Ola bubble. 
Um, it's like a little microcosm of like what could happen in the rest of the country. Um, but I do think, and I think it really helped for us that, 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 you know, to go to school, you need to wear a mask. So it, we weren't the first, you know, it's, it's sort of like, oh, they're doing it there. They're doing it over here. I might as well jump in and do it as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it was interesting in, in our conversations, um, our organization, our lobbying organization, California Arts Advocates worked very closely with the state when we were all shut down to try and get us reopened. Um, and to say one of the things is that, you know, the arts can actually, first of all, we're really committed to patron safety and, and performer safety. We, this is an industry that actually deeply cares about that and always has way before the pandemic. I mean, every venue has a mass, you know, ma massive safety plan, right, for all these different circumstances that can happen. And we're good at moving people, right? So what we do, we know how to move people through rooms and crowds and everything else. So, so there's, there's an aspect of that, but there's also the carrot, as you said, Nara, like, you know, the idea that if you do that X, Y, and Z, get vaccinated, your child can attend this. If you, you know, and that was the other thing that I think finally the light bulb went off at the state level too, where they went, oh, because we kept saying you're sidelining the wrong industry. Like this is an industry that can actually help. Um, get us to a place where more people are vaccinated and more people are experiencing, um, you know, are, are talking to each other and understanding what what's happening, right? This is massive what's happened to our world um, and to our communities. Um, and, and the impact is, is so great that we need the, the arts to, to help us to understand what is happening right now um, and, and to bring us together in that way. Um, uh, there's a specific question for Nara um, about, um, does your current vaccine vaccination policy match that of your local school district? And, um, and does it give a date that kids need to be vaccinated by? So she was just, someone was asking that specifically. So um, we, we are a few steps ahead of the schools. So our kids had to be 12 plus, had to be vaccinated um, by September. Um, and then five plus will will need to be vaccinated as, as soon as we have um, full FDA approval of the vaccine. So there are um, two other questions I was hoping we could get to, and I just if uh, if people have other questions, are welcome to put them in the Q and A. Um, but so one is just about resources. You know, there's um, there, the, Dr. Nanda wants us to only obviously access things that are scientific based and are factual based. Um, so we'll start with that um, <laughs> disclaimer, of course. But I know, for example, you know, there's a lot of uh, resources out there, particularly for our industry, trying to understand how to uh, adapt. So if you have those, if you would share those in the chat, um, the, uh, our panelists that are, are places that you go to and you look at to learn about um, how to do best practices, please do share. But, but what do you see as permanently changed in the way that you do business due to the ongoing nature of the pandemic? Like what has like, you don't see going away. I mean, you know, there's all these things that we've tried to, to do to, to adapt, but if you could say there's just certain things that you just, it's changed, business has changed. And what do you think it is that has, will, will be ongoing in your perspectives? Anybody can jump in. Brendan. Uh, in the first five years that I worked at um, our venues, I, we didn't give a single refund. And now we accepted 30 refunds yesterday from ticket sales. So that's a huge, huge change. And uh, the idea of the on-site the on-site refund or someone not comfortable with coming or, you know, that kind of health concern, you know, talk about, you know, Dr. Nanda's point of living with this. This is an ongoing thing. I, I think that's really, that that's a huge, huge change. I mean. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's just, a, it's a, it's a small, it's a, I, I think it's a, it's an odd data point, but for, mm -hmm for the for the large venue industry and the 
you know, that, mm -hmm. that's a big thing. Because I think theater companies had always done this, <laughs> you know, it was like, a, oh, you know, or we can take your ticket as a donation or, you know, I right. don't mean to minimize that by doing a silly little dance. But I mean, it's, uh, it's just a different style. It's a, it's a big, it's a yeah, big yeah, change. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Ticketing policies have had to adapt as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, does anyone else have any other thoughts on, on that particular question? Anything that you think is permanently changed? I mean, I think it's so hard to say what has permanently changed because we've already had to pivot so many times. And I think we're still like Dr. Nunes said, we're still very much in it and we're gonna have to continue to pivot um, as these new, new um, friends break through. Um, so yeah, it's hard to say what's changed, but I think, you know, in addition to like having these abilities to be hybrid and have a further reach and working from home and like that being accepted, like, oh, it's okay not to be chained to your desk. You can still be productive. Um, I think one of the things that, that struck me about that question was um, prioritizing health. So like um, I recently had, you know, a teaching artist who was sick and, you know, um, asked if, you know, they could come in and, you know, in the back it'd be like, okay, well, if you have a little sniffle, a little cough, like it's fine, you know, like, we would all show up to work sick, you know? Um, we're all guilty of doing it. And I think like right now, like just being mindful of everyone's health and well-being and doing just so much more risk management, like it's gonna out, it's gonna have greater benefits than just curbing the effects of, of COVID. And I, I think also integrating mental health practices into what we do. Like I think that we've sort of evolved, you know, um, sort of the mental health world has evolved and sort of, you know, checking in with people and how people are doing. And, you know, Brendan, you talked about the trauma that some of your frontline workers have to endure. And like, I had two teaching artists that didn't feel safe coming back and sort of like um, thinking, thinking about the, the effects that this is having on, you know, people's like mindfulness and well being. I think that's a huge change that is gonna continue to evolve. That's, that's uh, very true. And, and maybe a silver lining in, in all of this is if we are prioritizing health and, and mental health. Donna? Yeah, I'll be succinct. I think that, I think that masks are here to stay. Um, at the, I think that they will be uh, uh, used inside of indoor spaces like theaters and, and, and dance studios, that sort of thing for a while. Um, and, the, and I've heard a lot of people say we were sort of playing it fast and loose, you know, we're sitting in this packed theater breathing on each other in the first place. Um, I also think that sanitization efforts, that more that public places will continue to take those same uh, measures in order to keep things, because I think that in a sense it's common sense. Excellent. Somehow an hour and a half has gone by already. Um, it goes so fast with so many wonderful perspectives and, and really rich and important. So I really appreciate all of your perspectives and, and for sharing that with us today. Um, so thank you, Nara. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you, Dr. Nanda, so much for your, not only your incredible work that you do, um, but, uh, but also for this partnership on this series. So thank you. And um, I'm just going to just put a plug in because we all run nonprofits and I'm going to share that we are one of ourselves. And if um, we keep our, all of our programs free uh, so that, um, so that everyone can access them. But if you become a member, it helps us to keep those programs free. So I will throw a link in there for that. You, all of you should sh show your own links in terms of your organizations. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Nanda, I'll give you the last word, please. Thank you, Julie. You know, it's been now uh, wonderful hearing your experiences and um, I'll, I'll, I'll try and mesh uh, so many worlds when I, so many worlds when I share with you my concluding thoughts is that, you know, all that we've invested, we have learned, like some of us talked about prioritizing health, whether it's physical health, emotional health, mental health. And then if we, if we just look at the future, there is going to be perhaps not another pandemic of this proportion, but you will have more upheavals that will cause more disruption in non-healthcare setups also. 
So my point is all that you have invested right now, whatever you can hold on to, your resources, whatever your operations can hold on to, it's probably going to be worth it. Uh, you know, just on the side, we were looking at uh, things that have happened in the last 40 years. You know, I'm just giving you a glimpse into, you'll probably see it out in the next few months. What we have seen is the bugs that have caused more upheaval recently in the last 20 years, they have become way more frequent and they will keep becoming way more frequent and perhaps more divergent. By that, I mean more unique and more novel. Just because the world is a very small place, there is a lot of um, intermingling and exchange happening between animals and human beings and plants from different continents across the place, right? That's why this concept of one health uh, came to be. So, you know, just let's hold tight what we've invested in. Probably the return on investment is more than we know today. So I think it's a win-win. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for um, all of you for joining us here today. And um, this has been recorded. So I know a lot of folks, so oh boy, my power is about to go out. Um, <laughs> uh, life in Northern California. Um, and uh, a lot of folks will be tuning in to watch the recording. So thanks again to our panelists, to uh, Dr. Nanda and the USC Keck School of Medicine Center for Emerging Pathogens and uh, safe and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you.